So I'm going to go ahead and record to the cloud. All right, and then I'm going to play it from start. Okay. Uh, there's one image, so I put a couple of historical images, but you know, I pulled back. There's just one, and you know, we you've seen this image as well, um, an ethnographic image. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, my name is Eddie. Um, I am by no means an expert <clears throat> on this subject. As far as I know, there's only one in the, the US, and that would be Deborah Willis, who did all, most of the research. Um, but uh, I am going to discuss uh, early African-American daguerreotypists, more specifically. Um, as we all know, the daguerreotype was invented in or 1839, excuse me, 1839, um, and it came to America in 1840. Um, and Eddie, <clears throat> um, do you want to go full screen? So uh, yes, let me, yeah. let me do that. Let me, okay. Sorry about that. You know how to do that at the bottom? Um, ooh. Yeah. Let me see. Oh, uh, just at the bottom where there's that. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, except now we're seeing, um, let's see, we are seeing your uh, presenter mode. Oh, so, my. Let's see. I think I just saw Adrian pop in. Hey. Oh, nice. Yay. Hi. Oh. Hey, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Oh. Yay. I'm so excited. So at the top under the under the um, time, it says swap displays. Try that. Under the time. Kind of above your slide. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. Maybe you I can't can. see it because right now we're looking at um, the presenter view. Okay. You, you might be see. looking at the other view. All right, let me try this again. Okay. Sorry about the delay. Yeah, no problem. Otherwise, this is fine too. All right, let's see. And then okay. if you go oh, to the presenter. if you go to the bottom of the screen, there's like a little TV display. Yeah, try that. The T next to it. The the kind of like square with a little um, thing on the bottom. <laughs> Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah, right there. Yep. That should be. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So we're still, <clears throat> we're still seeing the same thing. Oh, well. There you go. That's okay. Don't worry about it. How's that? Yeah, it's fine. We're doing okay. Totally right, fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> um, these are all pre Civil War um, African American daguerreotypists, uh, which is what makes them interesting. Um, I think the, the primary purpose is to recognize that there were uh, well-known photographers of color uh, who documented a seldom seen portion of uh, American history uh, that I think that, you know, it's just starting to come to light today and to uh, briefly touch on the conscious effort that they used to take charge of their own image and their own communities. And of course, um, finally to generate uh, discourse of the shared history. Um, key notes that I wanted to make sure I mentioned that all of them were free persons of color. Um, Augustus Washington was descendant of slaves, but um, his parents were freed and then um, he was born a free person of color. Um, they all live in the North and these are from like actual Southern photographers, except for Jules Leon, the first photographer we're going to cover. Uh, but he lived in New Orleans and New Orleans um, was originally a French colony up until the, the excuse me, up until the Louisiana Purchase and they have a very unique category. So he was considered a mulatto, um, is what they would call it. And um, he, he walked in between uh, both societies. So he was able to do that in the South and he's isolated to, um, to the city of New Orleans. Um, and uh, let's go. <clears throat> so um, as we all know, the way African-Americans were portrayed prior to and even after the Civil War is rarely seen through the lens of other African-Americans, often viewed through the lens of the dominant Caucasian culture. You know, African-Americans were often viewed at best as anomalies, people who are really affluent, like Frederick Douglass, or a lot of, you know, dehumanizing so-called ethnographic pictures of formal slaves, um, like um, one of the images that I'll show you in a little bit. <clears throat> but um, what I'd like to do is offer kind of a rare glimpse into what was actually quite a large and well-known, um, well, two at least, very well-known photographers, not just known in their cities or towns, but nationally known, um, who photographed some of some of the most leading uh, characters of their times. 
normally when you look back at history pre-civil war images um, of african-american communities you see images like this or this colorized image here wait we're not are you are you going through your powerpoint yes i am is that okay, going by we're still we're still seeing the first image oh my let me see how about no no we just we're still seeing the first image weird um oh, do you want to maybe just stop it and reload it okay yeah yeah no problem sorry no no problem <laughs> i just want to make sure that we we get to see the images while you're talking okay let me see even though we practice you know it <laughs> i know it went fine the the first time yeah let me of course that <laughs> you share screen Back to PowerPoint. And the worst case scenario, you know, um, you could the, forward it to me. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. So now we're and on the then, colorized image. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and then where are my notes? There we go. Or images like this. Um, now, the next slide uh, of context. Is uh, researched by Louis Agassiz, who was uh, considered by many to be the father of modern science. Um, next images are um, ethnographic images. And uh, what he was working on was providing conclusive proof that Charles Darwin was wrong and that nature didn't cross boundaries and that he was trying to prove, you know, uh, pretty much white supremacy. <clears throat> during this time, these images were taken in 1850. So during the same time, these are daguerreotypes. Um, Frederick Douglass made the statement um, in one of his famous speeches that Negroes can never have impartial portraits at the hand of white artists because it seems to us next to impossible for white men to take the likeness of black men without the most grossly exaggerating their distinctive features. And the reason is obvious. Artists, like all other white persons, have developed a theory dissecting the distinctive features of the Negro psionomy. Um, and he was referring to like, images like these, which is something that would have been fairly common um, during his time and are often seen even to this day in history books and so on and so forth. <clears throat> These individuals, however, um, photographed during the same time um, communities of color and um, well, white sitters as well. And um, I would like to highlight these three because um, they're probably some of the biggest ones and they had the largest bodies of work. Um, the second two were prolific and they're in the Library of Congress. Um, you can go to the Museum of Cincinnati to find uh, James Presley Ball. He has an entire section of his work on display. And uh, you know, it's, it's amazing actually to go through and see the work that they did. So uh, Jules Leon is the first one that we're going to discuss. Um, he was primarily a lithographer, but he brought um, the daguerreotype to New Orleans and is considered by many to be the first Black photographer. And as we know, it was invented in 1839, so pretty much a year after it was invented, he brought it right over. Um, we don't have any, uh, I don't have very many images um, of his because his uh, career as a daguerreotypist was quite short, um, but we do have two images. Uh, James Presley Ball, however, um, has a massive, massive body work, and he worked um, the longest as the aerotypist, and he moved over to the ambrotype, and he pretty much changed and evolved with time, um, which is why so much of his work still survives today. Um, what makes him very interesting also is he used this platform to advocate for the abolition of slavery. And while he's known for being uh, a photographer from Cincinnati, um, he lived in a lot of states, Montana, Seattle, and eventually um, ending his life in Honolulu, I'm um, in like 1909. Uh, Augustus Washington also had a very large body of work, but he stayed with the daguerreotype. He never moved forward um, in the medium. So there's no ambrotypes or anything of his. And unfortunately, there are no images of the African-American sitters that he um, photographed during his time in Hartford, Connecticut that still survive or are known to have survived today. You know, perhaps in somebody's attic somewhere there's something, but. Um, there are no known um, copies of those. However, um, as you guys may or may not know, 
America began a colony in Africa called Liberia. And so there was a large movement for um, freed slaves to um, relocate from the United States and go to Africa. It was one of the earlier back to Africa movements, which you'll see later on in the 1920s with um, individuals like Marcus Garvey uh, pushing for another back to Africa movement. Um, and a lot of his images from that period um, do survive to this day. And they can also be located in the Library of Congress. <clears throat> so starting with Jules Leon, um, again, he's credited to be uh, by many the first black photographer in the Americas, um, having immigrated from France um, as a um, mixed heritage, you know, um, French and black um, photographer and introduced the Garotype to the city of New Orleans, um, which is what makes him significant, really. Again, there's not a very large body of work of his. This image is credited to him and is, as far as I know, the only um, daguerreotype portrait um, that's currently available. Um, he is known though for photographing landscapes and the cityscapes of uh, New Orleans at this time. While these are both lithographs, the one on the left um, of the cityscape is a lithograph based on or made from one of his earlier daguerreotypes. And again, I, there's not very many images um, made by him. Um, the really key takeaway is just, um, he's considered by many to be the first African-American photographer, which is what makes him historically significant. Um, but he was also quite large during his time um, doing um, uh, lithographs of um, many prominent people during his time, including Andrew Jackson, um, or President Andrew Jackson, who I think at the time was a general though. Uh, moving on to James Presley Ball, um, also known as J.P. Ball. Um, he was a Cincinnati-based photographer, but as I said before, you know, he moved around quite a bit. Um, he's probably one of the most um, prolific Black photographers um, prior to the Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War. Uh, many of his portraits of Civil War soldiers, both Black and white, survive to this day. Um, you'll find both the gyrotypes and ambrotypes. This um, card to visit images are still pristine, and we'll look at a few in uh, one second. Um, this is probably the biggest thing that I think he did, even though his uh, career spans so far, and he, he had such a large body of work. He created something called the Mammoth. Um, actually, I'm going to have to read this because it's absolutely ridiculous, the length of the name. Um, it was entitled Ball Splendid Mammoth Pictorial Tour of the United States, comprising views of the African slave trade of northern and southern cities, of cotton and sugar plantations of the Mississippi, Ohio, and Sukihana Rivers, Niagara Falls, and continued. I um, mean, it was a complete body of work, um, of drawings, uh, lithographs um, that highlighted slavery all the way from Africa, all the way across the Middle Passage and reflected the narratives of slaves at the time. And it was displayed as a rolling pan panorama. Um, what's really notable about the work is the cost. It cost about $6,000, covered more than 23,000 square feet of canvas. And um, at the end of his uh, ball, he kind of made a prophetic uh, statement using um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's 1842 poem, The Warning. Um, saying that if we don't solve this problem, the country's headed toward disaster. Uh, the part he left was, um, there is a poor blind Samson in this land, shorn of his strength and bound in bands of steel, who may in some grim level raise his hand and shake the pillars of our common wheel to the vast temple of our liberties and shapeless mass of wreck and rubbish lies. And the Civil War began um, in 1861, so... Uh, about six years after he made that prediction and put his uh, big mammoth pictorial tour out, um, the Civil War did follow. <clears throat> um, so Eddie, were, was this like was this a painting? I mean, it's on canvas, so how was it depicted? Do you know, it was a number of drawings and lithographs, um, potentially with um, the stereotypes used also in the lithograph. Okay. Unfortunately, it does not survive today, okay. but this uh, Ball's Mammoth Pictorial Tour uh, sheet cutout, I think it's about 50 so pages explaining every scene oh, okay. in 
the thing. So it's left to the imagination. Right. But it was widely well received um, in the, uh, at least in the Northern states, um, especially amongst abolitional communities um, and possibly even overseas. It was written about in several newspapers um, international or nationally. Mm -hmm. And um, um, he was of a household name. You know, people knew who uh, J.P. Ball was right. during this. Thank you. So he definitely was not obscure. Um, he photographed uh, notable individual, individuals, including Frederick Douglass, the mother and sister of former general and president Ulysses S. Grant. Um, his work was widely acclaimed um, in the pre-Civil War society. And uh, you know, he used his work to craft images of black sitters. This is a lithograph of his Daguerrean gallery. And uh, you can see from the scale that um, it was, you know, it wasn't like a small hole in the wall gallery. He had a massive gallery that was um, really luxuriously furnished and laid out. And um, people of all colors would come and view his daguerreotypes, uh, which, you know, even at this time, I think is extremely impressive. It looks like there might've been some paintings or something on display as well. Uh, they would have been daguerreotypes, but it, yes, also paintings or lithographs and other pieces of mm -hmm. art yeah. as well. Yeah, obviously very wealthy looking, <laughs> the yes. gallery itself. And then um, here's an article. Um, so $1 to, uh, for J.P. Ball's daguerrean rooms. They sold uh, lockets, rings, and breast pins. Um, and it was, uh, the cost was a dollar, which in 1858 would have been approximately $34 today. So just to show, you know, to give an idea of, you know, how, how successful he was during his time. These are some of the images that um, he, was, he had taken. Um, this case on the right, you'll see with a lot of the uh, types, um, it was very common during the Civil War, um, they were often emblazoned with uh, Union or Confederate um, motifs. So if you were to go on eBay, for example, and type in the daguerreotype Union case, you can still pick them up for 20, 30 bucks. Um, some really old daguerreotypes from the Civil War of Civil War soldiers, which is cool because there's like a nice little piece of history that you can own quite easily. Um, um, these are actually carte de visites taken by um, J.P. Ball in his studios in Montana. And as you can see from the sitters, the way that they're dressed, um, their jewelry, their pins, um, the environment, the way that they hold themselves, um, that there are, there are people of affluence or, you know, some sort of a, a higher liver, living standard, excuse me. <clears throat> Here's some more images. The one on the left is Frederick Douglass, and the one on the right is um, J.P. Ball's son, um, James Presley Ball Jr. Um, here are, again, uh, on the left, another daguerreotype, and I believe the one on the right would be an ambrotype. Um, the one on the right is absolutely awesome. You know, it's a little boy. He's leaning. He's, he's dressed up quite nicely, nice leather boots and uh, you know, put together and that a, a photograph cost $34 during that time. And you'd have to imagine the amount of wealth that his parents must have had to have their son's individual photo taken. So that would probably be an ambrotype on the right because it's on paper. Yes. Uh, yes. Not an ambrotype, I'm sorry, an albumin print. Oh, albumin, ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. uh, so he, did you say he did do some, some ambrotypes or some, some um, uh, glass negatives? Uh, JP Probably. Ball, um, he continued to grow and change with the technology. Okay, so yeah, that um, would be, so that would be an albumin print from a wet plate negative, most likely. Okay. Thank you, and thank that's you. that's how those uh, carte de visite <clears throat> or those look more like cabinet cards probably mm -hmm. um, prior to this. The ones mm -hmm. that are, they're kind of like about five by seven mm -hmm. inches with the, yeah. the um, can the we one go one. back one? Actually? Yes, yes, please. Um, yeah, if we can just go back, I don't know. 
to the here. yeah right here so um what i think is interesting to see for for the students in the class for sure is we looked at these cabinet cards and you can see here the name of you know jp ball and son the that's would be the studio name and the location and all of that was kind of like an advertisement for for him for others to come and and have their portraits made but those would also be albumin prints on cardboard and it's interesting that you have one that's like that really decorative cutout too there's all kinds of different um you know shapes and things of these cabinet cards which are so beautiful thank you yeah the quality is is absolutely amazing as well i think mm -hmm. um, considering how old these images are yeah um um, some more daguerreotypes that he'd taken. Um, on the one on the right is interesting because it is a uh, three unidentified women, but it, it's a family of Caucasian women, which post Civil War would have been absolutely unheard of. But during this time, at least in northern states, it was apparently quite common because there's hundreds of images like this. Um, this is a lot to read, um, so I'm just going to summarize it for you. Um, this image of uh, the two men, um, they are from the Wisconsin's 22nd Infantry Regiment. Um, the woman in the middle is an escaped slave. This took place in 1862, which is uh, about a year after the Civil War started. Um, and she had decided that to run away and they helped her escape. Now, it was illegal to assist um, escaped slaves, even for Union soldiers. Um, and it definitely was not um, something that you would want to be photographing um, as a photographer during this time. But he made the point um, to take this photograph, knowing fully well um, the message that it sent. Um, so we know what side he was rooting for, obviously. Um, the symbolism in the photo, you know, they're standing there as protectors of this woman who's escaped. And, you know, they put her in, some, in a really nice dress. and. Um, she uh, apparently made it to um, to freedom and lived out the rest of her life somewhere in the northern United States. So I thought that was a really cool, uh, really cool story, and it um, speaks to his activism in his um, abolitionistic efforts as well. So can I just interject something here, <laughs> and yes, maybe yes. open it open it up to the others? Is when I first saw this image. Um, you know without the context of it i sort of felt like it looked like she was captured you know like the, the guys in the photograph are her captors not her protectors um because of the fact that the gun is pointing at her you know so i, I thought you were gonna say that um one of the things maybe that paul was or ball was doing was um making it look like the people that are helping her are her captors to 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 make oh. the photograph you know what i mean yeah, that's a very interesting uh way of looking at it i i noticed the clothing per, uh, perhaps was probably my first clue it was like um i don't think they would have let her dress as nicely if they had captured her yeah you know get your get yourself put together so we can <laughs> yeah so do you think that um do you think, or I'm wondering, even just any of the students here, do, what what do you think about the gun pointing at her? Because to me, that's obviously this is a posed photograph, but the idea of the gun pointing at her to me doesn't feel like it's protecting her. It feels a little bit, um, you know. And this is, I mean, we're looking at this, you know, a long, long time um, later. So we can we can have different opinions of that, but I was just wondering if anybody else had any thoughts about that. Could it be that um, it could show like you could be on either side, a protector or the captor, because uh, it kind of looks like they they're interchangeable in a uh -huh. sense for me. Yeah, like uh, one guy could be a captor or he could be a protector, <laughs> and kind of. Well, and I mean, she doesn't look horrified or really anything. She, you know, um, I don't know. I just found it really interesting. 
<laughs> you know, Funny. to to think about that idea of, you know, these guys are on her side, but without the context, without the written context, it's hard to to kind of know that. Johnny. Yeah. Um, from just a military militaristic standpoint. Yeah. The way that they're two they're standing where they're both have their guns in a standard ready position. Uh huh is a guardian position ah, in the military he's okay. not pointing his weapon at her even though it appears to be so he has it at the ready got it ready to go it's and it would be different if the other individual was point was also pointing his weapon at him okay but because they're both the same perfect that's, that's where that context comes from thank you for that explanation that's very helpful <laughs> and they're standing at the ready okay that makes perfect sense and then also, um, if you go through a lot of the old Civil War um, era images, mm -hmm. um, you don't usually see them in a pose like this, but um, that pose is quite popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I mean, um, you know, there. I mean, that was one of the things with the Civil War is you couldn't have any action photographs because photography was too slow at the time, so everything had to be posed. But that that makes perfect sense, Jeff. Thank you so much for that explanation. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> All, right. All right. And then um, we have Augustus Washington. Um, Augustus Washington is really interesting. He, he was, um, um, like I said earlier, um, his parents at one point were slaves, but were freed. He was born a free person of color. Um, was very well educated. I'm reading the th some of the things that he'd written, um, you know, articulate as well. Um, he attended Dartmouth College for a little while, but um, he couldn't afford to continue to pay. So um, he went and opened a small studio and photographed, you know, both people of color and Caucasian people, and was one of the most successful daguerreotypes, uh, daguerreotypists in the history of Hartford in Connecticut. Um, this is a, a what, do you, what do you call it, an illustration from the Connecticut Historical Society taken out of the 1852 Hartford Daily Current of Washington photographing the world. I'm almost advertising for him. Um, these images um, have, were all taken in Liberia, which means that they are post-Civil War, um, but right after the Civil War. So that would be um, anywhere from 1865 to um, maybe the early 1870s. So Washington um, went to Liberia? Yes, um, this is the big thing about uh, Washington was um, he was really interested in abolition um, and was really interested in portraying African-Americans um, and humanizing them. But um, one of the things that he wrote or a quote from him is, Whatever it may be a colored man's natural capacity and literal attainment or literary attainment, excuse me, I believe that as soon as he leaves the academic halls to mingle in the only society he can find in the United States, unless he be a minister or a lecturer, he must and will retrograde. Uh, what he's saying is that um, it doesn't really matter how educated or how smart or you know who you are. Um, being in the United States, you know, you're going to be forced and pushed down and pushed back and you won't be able to succeed, which is why he really championed the idea of um, African-Americans returning to Africa to colonize Liberia. And um, he took a very, very active role in that process. Um, some of um, the photographs um, that I'll show you later, there's um, the one of John Brown that he did in his Hartford uh, studio, but um, he went on to move to Liberia and these are all former slaves um, or, you know, or free persons of color as well um, that eventually took over the government of uh, Liberia. And uh, that's why we have all their names as well um, because they're all prominent. Uh, citizens during that time. Um, he did do work, though, for the Africa Colonization Society with the mission of sending back imagery on the progress of the colonization in Liberia. But it, his aim was to demonstrate to other African Americans that it was not only feasible to set up a new life in Africa, but that was better. And um, though there is like the arrow types and different 
um, photographic technology coming out, he actually stuck with the daguerreotype the entire time that he um, did his photographs. So um, as you can see, I, um, this person on the left would be Joseph Jenkins Roberts, um, the first and seventh president of Liberia, um, Chancey Brown, Sergeant of Arms of Liberian Senate, <clears throat> um, uh, our merchants. Um, I haven't been able to identify this man here. And then uh, of course, to my very favorite image of John Brown smiling, which is not one that's commonly seen. This was taken in Hartford, Connecticut um, by Augustus Washington. And uh, it was given to his family and um, remained in their care until um, it was eventually sold um, to a museum. But um, as I was discussing uh, with Professor Begg earlier, what makes it really interesting is that he's kind of smiling. And that's something that was almost unheard of during this time period. Um, this would have been taken um, prior to the Civil War. Um, John Brown um, committed his raid on Harper's Ferry, um, I'd like to say about four years or four or five years before the Civil War took place. So, and this is well before he even fought in Kansas. So this would have been in the 1850s, most likely, that this image was taken. Um, people remember this picture of John Brown and, um, oh, 1846 to 1847, so not even the 1850s, excuse me. Um, the, uh, the contrast, I think, between that image and the first image and this one um, in the Smithsonian Institution, when they were writing about it, and they say he exudes intensity consistent with his fanaticism um, and, ex you know, appears angry and determined, you know, taking his oath and holding his uh, subterranean passway flag, which was the militant alternative to the Underground Railroad. And for those who are not familiar with um, who John Brown is, uh, John Brown was an abolitionist who believed that the only way to end slavery was through violent military uh, insurrection and committed a, a raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia um, that was not successful and ended up with him being um, executed um, for treason. That said, um, with the rise of the Civil War, his uh, image and appearance um, in the public view, especially in the North at, at least, um, changed a lot and um, his name became a battle cry. So he then in turn became a martyr. Um, some people credit John Brown for um, pushing over one of those early blocks that began the Civil War. And um, while it is debated, um, a lot of historians um, have put up some very um, strong arguments um, to that nature. Uh, I think the, uh, the biggest thing, uh, the biggest takeaway um, from um, these images and from this time period is uh, that uh, I feel like um, there was a different um, perspective between the North and the South, and it's evident in the way that um, these businesses were able to run. I mean, the photographic or the photo studios taking in both Black and white um, sitters in their photo galleries versus in the South, where um, you're going to get more of the earlier images, um, if images were taken at all. And uh, you won't see those different, you know, that, that portrayal in the same way. And I think that gives us even more insight into what the country was like during that time, which is what makes these images extremely historically significant and uh, why we should look into photo uh, photographers um, of color during this time, because it highlights um, the, the uh, what is the word I'm looking for? The- Discrepancies? Yeah, and perhaps discrepancies, but, like we don't really see um, that side of history, mm -hmm. you know. Like, um, like there was some, at, at least to a degree, integration mm -hmm. in the north, which post Civil War, you know, even in the north would have been absolutely unheard of, and um, so something changed. Yeah, you know, somewhere along the line, and I didn't even realize that until you start going through these images. And I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of images by some of these photographers 
And you see it's not uncommon to see both black and white sitters mm -hmm. visiting a black photo studio. Right. Yeah, I mean, it feels like there needs to be so there's so much more research that could be and should be made. You know, maybe it's in the makes now or in the works. I don't know. But Deborah Willis is definitely the the foremost um, knowledgeable person in this category. Yes, and that's why I'm um, for my sources. She's the very first book. Um, as far as I know, hers is the only book that covers um, African-American photographers from its inception from 1840 to present. Um, there's a massive number of really great images. She gives some historical context. Um, the early um, 1840s to um, about uh, just after post-Civil War, um, there still isn't really a massive amount of different photographers. But um, if I can recall from our research, there were 57 known Black photographers in the United States between 1840 and um, all the way up until the post-Civil War, early 1900s period. Why, why does she use 1840 as the starting date, do you know? Because the the daguerreotype was invented in 1839. And oh, and he didn't, he didn't bring it to, <clears throat> to uh, New Orleans yes. until then, right? Yeah. 1840. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That's why I would, that's why it starts in 1840 instead of right. 1830. Right, right, right. Another, another fun fact though, um, the second ever daguerreotype show in the United States was done by Jules Leon. Um, the first one being in New York and the second by Jules Leon in New Orleans. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Very, <clears throat> very good. Really interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions if anyone needs or if anybody wants to ask any questions or make any comments, this is the time to do it. Anybody? I'm just looking to see, just shout out if you have any questions. Um, has this opened your eyes to, um, new information because I certainly have didn't cover this I mean the I was telling Eddie earlier that you know the really the only thing that that I covered so far was Frederick Douglass and all of the photographs that were taken of him um you know in the 19th century and that he was one of the most photographed people and he made sure that he was photographed to to use that um but in terms of of you know showing um photographers um black photographers there's there's like nothing in our book that even covers that so it's it's definitely a chapter that needs to be added um a lot of things need to be added to the book actually um so i really appreciate you bringing in this information to the class and you know, enlightening um, us on um, what was happening. And Professor, I hope go, go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, as a black person, were they, did they have to hide to make those photographs or something like that? You know, slavery was very common in those times. Did they have to have their like hidden place to take pictures or they were allowed to take pictures anywhere? These were, um, very large and very prominent uh, photographers who ran their own studios and okay. um, were very, very well known. So no, um, no. But, uh, again, as I prefaced in the beginning, all of this took place in Northern states. Northern, okay. Uh, Augustus Washington was active in Connecticut and Hartford and um, J.P. Ball was in Montana and Cincinnati and Seattle, all in the Northern um, hemisphere of, of the United States. And um, of, of course, Jules Leon being the exception, um, but he's in New Orleans, uh, which had a very distinct um, kind of three race cast where you would have had um, Caucasians, um, non-free black people, and then okay. people who were mixed race or Creoles mm -hmm. um, who kind of skirted somewhere in between um, the color line, which is why he was able to do what he was doing in the South. 
Okay, um, I ask because um, there's not many, it's like you mentioned, there weren't many um, written things in books, right. like the one we're reading right now, Seizing there's the Light, and, yeah. and almost nothing. So I thought that had to do with something that had to do with like, they, they didn't have many privileges or anything like that to make um, their photograph shown. But as I've seen, you have shown many of them and and well, I mean, I think that, I think that's an interesting um, point, Elizabeth. The other thing is, you know, in the art historical canon, it tends to be white men. Yes, <laughs> you know, so exactly, and and that's I think what what we're hoping to maybe change um, is that that that's not what it it ends up being because yes. obviously there are others making um, images exactly. Um, and uh, I think I want to say, did you find in your research, Eddie, were there any black women photographers? Not the stereotypists, okay. but uh, once we moved into the 1920s, yeah, um, there were some black women yeah. that were actually active as photographers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. During that period, who did really um, massive amounts of documentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, the book that Reflections in Black by Deborah Willis is like the the go to source, um, and I, I believe the only one that I know of, at least, that covers um, specifically African American photography. Yeah. Uh, getting back to also, you mentioned Frederick Douglass um, using the image to um, really take control of the narrative of himself. Sojourner Truth would have been the other person who did that during the same time period. And yeah. I believe he was also photographed by Augustus Washington. I know that there are photographs of her. I don't know who they're by, but yeah, that's that's an interesting, um, I have one in my, <laughs> that's sad to say I have one. Um, but yeah, that but I think it was Augustus Washington that that took that photograph. But yeah, that's an interesting, Oh, so many things, so many things, so little time. <laughs> We're going to fly through like 50 years today. So, um, yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Anybody? That's really great information. I so appreciate you coming in and sharing your information and your findings with me and my class. Um, and please keep in touch and um, maybe we can have you do this again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Really appreciate it. Take care, Thanks, guys. Adrian. Thanks for making an appearance. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was so good. Love this lecture, Eddie. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very care. much. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> See you. Okay. So to continue on. Um, now, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> now that he's now that he's gone, I'm sorry. I had to correct him on the the cabinet card. I was like, oh, we went over that in class. I can't let him get away with calling it a carte de visite. I, I was geeking out there. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's see. So, I want to just go over the next assignment with you all. Which